Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless daniel 9 26 and 27 and after the 62 weeks messiah shall be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war desolations are determined then he the antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many who is israel the Palestinians and possibly other Muslim nations for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. Are we seeing any signs of a covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies today? Turning to Iran, where the Islamic Republic's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, addressing an Islamic Unity Conference in Tehran, referred to Israel as a cancer that will definitely be destroyed by the hands of the Palestinians, and what he referred to as resistance forces in the entire region. This cancer will definitely be destroyed by the hands of the Palestinians and the resistance forces in the entire region, God willing. The Iranian Supreme Leader, whose proxy forces continue to foment terror at Tehran's behest throughout the region, went on to address prospective normalization between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel. The definite position of the Islamic Republic is that countries that make the gamble of normalization with Israel will lose. They are betting on a losing horse. In response to Ayatollah Khamenei, Israeli Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu during a tour of Israel's northeastern Golan Heights, not far from the armistice line with Syria, voiced confidence in prospective peacemaking between Jerusalem and Riyadh. While Khamenei's terrorist regime exports ruin and destruction, Israel is advancing progress and peace. Just as Iran did not prevent us from achieving the Abraham Accords, neither will Iran prevent us from further expanding the circle of peace for the benefit of the citizens of Israel, the peoples of the region, and all humanity. Jeremiah 8.11 For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. What does peace, peace? when there is no peace, mean in Jeremiah 8.11. Jeremiah the prophet proclaimed that judgment was coming upon Jerusalem. However, Jeremiah was opposed by the king and the priests who did not want to hear his message. False prophets who claimed to speak for God also contradicted Jeremiah's message. Jeremiah proclaimed bloodshed, destruction, and judgment when Babylon conquered Jerusalem. The false prophets, on the other hand, said that the future of Jerusalem looked bright. Jerusalem could look forward to peace, not war. The phrase, peace, peace, when there is no peace, is found in Jeremiah 6.14 as well as Jeremiah 8.11. It is also found in Ezekiel 13.10 and 16. In all four places, it has the same meaning in the same historical context. Jeremiah was like a doctor delivering bad news to his patient, and his diagnosis was, Unless drastic measures were taken, the patient would die. However, the false prophets gave a second opinion. Don't listen to Jeremiah, they said. You are going to be just fine. Instead of radical surgery and a drastic change of lifestyle, the priests and false prophets said a light bandage was all that was needed. The following passage is found in Jeremiah 6.13 and 14 and repeated in Jeremiah 8.10 and 11. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, 
when there is no peace. When the priests and false prophets said, peace, peace, they were denying that judgment was on the way. They were giving the people false assurances. The explicit assumption is that Jerusalem and Judah had not committed grievous sins and that God was not displeased with them. In fact, according to the false prophets, God was quite happy with his people and wanted to bless them. They promised peace, peace. Unfortunately, their promised peace would not come. The book of Jeremiah bears this out and, in the end, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon, just as God had said. People like to hear good news, and they do not want to hear that God's judgment is coming. The watchmen of our time have the job of delivering that bad news. God bore witness against the people to whom Isaiah was sent to minister, calling them rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction, as we read in Isaiah 39 that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord. Such people have closed their ears to the word of the Lord and desire to hear only peace, even when there is no peace. They say to God's prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things, prophesy illusions. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. As we read in Isaiah 30, 10 and 11, who says to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Just as Jeremiah the prophet proclaimed that judgment was coming upon Jerusalem, the watchmen of our time are warning of God's soon coming judgment on a wicked and unrepentant world. Are you listening? 1 Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So how does peace and security lead to sudden destruction? And what is the sudden destruction? Is it the rapture of the church? Is it the revealing of the Antichrist? Is it war? While we can conjecture what the sudden destruction is, the Apostle Paul tells us Christians are not part of it. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. In these verses of scripture, the Apostle Paul is undoubtedly talking about the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, For when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The Apostle Paul makes a distinction between we and they. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, along with the dead in Christ and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul says, While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The sudden destruction that comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape could very well be when the rapture occurs. The sudden destruction comes upon them while they are saying peace and security. Sudden destruction comes, and this is where the distinction the Apostle Paul makes comes into play. They will not escape. That would seemingly indicate that we escape as we read in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Sudden is the Greek word epnidios, which means unexpected, suddenly. Destruction is the Greek word alethros, which means ruin, i.e. death, punishment. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 could be translated like this. For when they say peace and security, then unexpected and sudden punishment comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Could it be that this sudden destruction is the rapture of the church? 1 Corinthians 15.52 tells us that the rapture will happen suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15.50-54 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Twinkling is the Greek word repe, which means a jerk of the eye. By analogy, an instant, i.e. suddenly. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church? We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6, 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this, will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly, a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however? will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church, the revealing of the Antichrist, and war? According to the Kuwaiti newspaper Al Jarida, Iran is working toward a complex arms deal that would move some Hezbollah weapons in Syria and Lebanon to Russia. The four-way deal threatens both Israel and Ukraine. The move could result in increased weapons flow, especially new Iranian weapons, to Hezbollah. Older weapons would reportedly be moved away from Hezbollah and to Russia or pro-Iranian militias. Hezbollah tends to stockpile weapons and would send surplus to Moscow. The goal is further Iranian entrenchment in Syria. Since intervening in the Syrian civil war, Hezbollah has benefited and established itself in areas in Syria like Aleppo and the Golan. When Russia invaded Ukraine last year, reports circulated in Arabic media that Russia might shift forces to Ukraine and that Iran could benefit in Syria by backfilling the Russian vacuum. Hezbollah will hand over a large portion of its older weapons to the Arab tribes in Syria in exchange for receiving new generation Iranian weapons. Moscow will obtain a portion of the Hezbollah weapons and ammunition to supply its costly war in Ukraine. Hezbollah has an estimated 150,000 rockets and masses of weapons it illegally acquired over the decades, most of them from Iran. Russia's benefit lies in the arms as well, as it grants Moscow cheap ammunition and shells and rockets. It's unclear how Moscow would transfer the weapons. Turning to Iran, where the Islamic Republic's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, addressing an Islamic Unity Conference in Tehran, referred to Israel as a cancer that will definitely be destroyed by the hands of the Palestinians and what he referred to as resistance forces in the entire region. This cancer will definitely be destroyed by the hands of the Palestinians and the resistance forces in the entire region, God willing. As we continue to watch Bible prophecy unfold, it seems as though the War of Gog and Magog is looming on the horizon. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you, be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel. Russia, Iran, Turkey, 
Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin the infamous Gog of Magog that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian, and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know him, and the sooner the better. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. As United States tested FEMA emergency alert system, Putin ordered Russians to put on gas masks and prepare for a World War III nuclear attack. <laughs>
Well, Russia may be planning to test a nuclear-powered missile. According to a report in the New York Times, satellite images recently captured aircrafts and planes moving near a remote base in the Arctic. That movement mirrored launches, launch preparations rather, for earlier missile tests in 2017 and 2018. So for more on this, we are joined by retired U.S. Army Major and Military Analyst Mike Lyons. What does this actually mean? You know, people hear nuclear and they go nuclear, but we're talking about nuclear powered. Tell us what exactly we're, we're seeing here. It's an exotic weapon. You know, you don't usually use nuclear power to provide thrust for propulsion for, for weapon systems. Um, what this will give Russia capacity for is to take um, a low yielding, potentially nuclear weapon and then use it and to have it uh, travel a greater distance, tens of thousands of miles. This provides a strategic view, though. Like, let's say they have this in the Arctic where they're testing it right now. They could easily launch this missile from that platform and hit targets in the United States, not using ICBMs. ICBMs are intercontinental. They require space programs. They go out in outer space. They're a much more different weapon system. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Luke. 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation.
One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.